Good morning. Uh, if you're on the worship team, would you stand, please? Or are you on the steering committee or the sound team? Because it's all part of the same thing. Would you stand up? If you're on the worship team in any way, you're on the sound team, look at those guys back there. It's Thanksgiving weekend, so we can say thanks. Hey. Thank you. Awesome this morning, awesome worship. It's fun to step in. You know, as I got ready this morning, I thought I was putting on antiperspirant, but I think I was putting on perspirant because, man, it, was, it is hot up here. Hey, Merry Christmas. Yeah, it's the first Sunday of Advent. Yeah, we say Merry Christmas here. I see that Target put it back up after a few years ago. They decided to, oh, well, uh, I guess it's better to draw folks in with Merry Christmas than not. So turn to somebody and say Merry Christmas. Oh, that was too short. Get up and tell somebody Merry Christmas. How's that? I know, yeah, it's not like Lake Sam, right? Joy to the world. Hi, Dave. Merry Christmas, Dave. Okay. We were the friendly church. The holiday season is such a perplexing and joyful and stressful time all at once. Maybe you feel a little bit like Sally Brown or Charlie Brown. I've been looking for you, big brother. Will you please write a letter to Santa Claus for me? Well, I don't have much time. I'm supposed to get down to the school auditorium and direct a Christmas play. You write it and I'll tell you what I want to say. Okay, shoot. Dear Santa Claus, how have you been? Did you have a nice summer? How is your wife? I have been extra good this year. So I have a long list of presents that I want. Oh, brother. Please note the size and color of each item and send as many as possible. If it seems too complicated, make it easy on yourself. Just send money. How about tens and twenties? Tens and twenties? Oh, even my baby sister. All I want is what I have coming to me. All I want is my family. <laughs> it reminds me of my sister Roseanne so bad. All I want is what I have coming to me. All I want is my fair share. You know, the Christmas before I came to know Jesus, I found out a little bit more about Christmas than I ever had before. I got a glimpse about how Christmas should really be. And that Christmas literally saved my life. I found out that Christmas was not about getting something or giving something or how much I spent or so, how much someone spent on me, but helping other people get to the spirit of the season. Charlie Brown was frustrated about it because he knew that that wasn't it, but Sally Brown thought that that was how you did it. I love that. How many of you have seen that so many times? I mean, it's, just, it's so great, isn't it? The ending part is really good too. But that Christmas I started to understand that I needed to help people arrive at the spirit of the season. And that was before I came to faith. The Christmas that I came to faith was the most mysterious and overflowing and fulfilling Christmas I ever had. If you want to ask me about that, how it saved my life, you can ask me about that later. I discovered something in the Christmas after I came to know the Lord about the revelation and the intimacy of Christmas. And I think I discovered at least one secret, and the secret was giving oneself to God. The holiday season is alive with uh, intimacy and family and friends being together or maybe family friends and one of your enemies, I don't know. Special moments of revealing and bonding are supposed to happen. Or maybe the holidays separate you. Maybe you're not looking for the holidays at all, saying something like, not this, fill in the blank, again, I just can't do that. I've done that a few times. How about you? It was uncomfortable, so I stayed away. I think this is known as avoidance therapy. <laughs> you know, there's nothing wrong with being different. Ski vacations, a trip to Hawaii, winterizing your car. Well, maybe that's a little bit much. Yeah, you know, something from the norm is okay. Christmas season is supposed to be different, closer, warmer, more cherished than what we consider about the everydayness of life. What if, just what if, instead of depending on other people or on circumstances to bring the true spirit of Christmas that we ask God to pour out grace on them through us, 
so we could experience some moments of intimacy that help them understand God, help them understand us, and us, them. What if? And maybe in the process, we unwrap God a little bit more this Christmas. There's a close proximity to God at Christmas. It's really all about intimacy because one of the uh, promised scriptures is uh, that he would be, Jesus would be God with us, Emmanuel. Doesn't get any closer than that. In our society, it's too bad that intimacy is only, it seems to me, most times associated with sex. It's nearness, it's revealing. This intimacy, which, you, you know, sex is part of intimacy, but it's, it's not the whole picture. The other intimacy, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, should come before all that, obviously, under the covenant of marriage, but it brings relationships to another level. Actions associated with intimacy become dear to those involved in the moment. There's a multitude of senses and feelings that are involved at many levels. Your memory, my memory becomes etched, literally. It's chiseled into your brain when those moments occur. And you'll never forget them. One that I remember is when Maureen and I were, Maureen, where are you, Maureen? There she is. Stand up, honey, because not everybody knows you, okay? Because you're such a babe, okay? Yeah. I remember, yeah, you could, yeah, it's all right. So you can clap. So those of you looking forward, you males getting, looking forward to getting married, I'm sorry, I got the best one, so ha ha. But I remember as we got to know one another and we thought that God was leading us together, uh, I remember a moment, and she says that I described this moment really well about where we were when she asked me a game-changing question. And it was about intimacy. And it was, it was really, really powerful. And my response was, I will take care of you, and this is who we are together as a couple. And that came before the ring did, which I gave her twice, but that's another story too. We're going to ask Mike Byron to pray real quick. Mike, where are you? There he is. Would you pray for uh, uh, ourselves here today, those that are uh, away from us on, on trip, and also another church in the area? God, boy. Wow. Breathe on us today, please. We need not just your word through Greg. Uh, we need your heart. Yeah, God. Just write your word on each of our hearts today so that we can go out and do the kind of stuff Greg seems to be challenging us to do. And Lord, we also lift up the people that aren't here, especially those that are close to us that we care about. Lord, give us your heart for them. Just be our Lord. Yes, Lord. And Lord, I lift up uh, Blue Sky Church down the road. Just ask that you'd be um, renewing them this morning and giving them what they need to, uh, to be your children. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Mike. Now, all that, I'm going to talk about Hannah this morning. When I was in the middle of a depressive episode about 13, 14 years ago, actually I wasn't in the middle, I was at the tail end of it. And I was reading by myself the story about Hannah in 1 Samuel 1. And the story of Hannah kind of goes like this. And I have the scripture, but, you know, I don't have to put it up there. I mean, if you have it in your Bible, you can do it as homework. But I'm going to tell you the story. I'm going to refer to the scriptures, you know, as we go. That Hannah was one of two wives of a guy named Elkanah. I wonder if his mom said, Elk, time for dinner. Um, and Hannah was also in this relationship, this marriage relationship with Peninnah. Now, Peninnah had kids, and Hannah did not. And you would think that Peninnah, having children, would have grace on Hannah, but she didn't. <laughs> she vexed her. Peninnah was a mean girl. Have you seen that movie? Mean girl. She was a mean girl. And not only did she do it in the home as far as, you know, vexing Hannah, but especially when they go up to worship. Peninnah was, yeah, well, you don't have any kids. God hasn't blessed you. You know, she'd just honor her all the time. She'd bully her. You know people like that? You know, they have a lot. And, and, and those of us that don't have what they have, instead of saying, well, let me share it with you, they pick, you don't have this, right? And, and Hannah, she just, every time they would go up to worship at Shiloh, Elkanah and Peninnah and Hannah, it got worse 
because Hannah was reminded that she was not blessed, that she had almost like the curse of God upon her because she didn't have any children. And again, Peninnah would bug her. And in this one instance, when they went up to worship, Peninnah had been vexing her. Don't you love that word? Vexing. <laughs> you know, wow, that's a great word. Vexing. She was vexing her, and Elkanah, her husband, came up to Hannah and said, I give you a double portion. And Hannah started crying. And he said, Hannah, aren't I better th- to you than ten sons? No. <laughs> no, we're going to talk about that. In fact, once Hannah heard that, she took off and she went to go pray near the tabernacle. And when she went to go pray near the tabernacle, she poured out her heart to the Lord. She, she, just, she just let go of everything. Um, there's there's uh, some places here that I want to I wanna talk about with you that she was in deep anguish. Have you been there? She was in deep anguish. She cried bitterly. She prayed earnestly, and she vowed solemnly. I don't know if you've ever been at that place of prayer, but I have several times. Not as many times as I would like to have been. And saw great answers, not right away, but seen great answers to prayer and those things. And when I was at the, the tail end of this depressive episode, I could see that I could, I could do that. I, I, could have, I could be there like Hannah was, and it gave me hope that God would hear my prayer, that he would lift me out because I was dependent on him. And for that reason, I'm impressed with the level of intimacy, the depth level in Hannah's prayer. She lays out all of her sorrow, her disappointment, her bitterness, her forgottenness, her loneliness, and it's so stirred and amazes me, it still does, it impacts me, that I can go to the Lord like that. There are some great lessons in spiritual intimacy here. And these intimate moments revolve around prayer, obviously, worship. Worship is mentioned seven times in that first chapter. A vow that she makes, Eli, who's in leadership with his two sons, and then her follow-through. So, how is our level of prayer and intimacy with the Lord? Selah. Think about that for a minute. Could our prayer lives use an upgrade? What's your reaction? You know, one of a pastor I used to work with, said, boy, the quickest way to clean out a room is to say we're going to have a prayer meeting. <laughs> and it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. Because <laughs> I felt guilty to stay, you know, being former Catholic and everything. Um, <laughs> I didn't want to leave. But what, what's, our, what's our sense about prayer? What, what is it about prayer rooms and prayer closets? It, <laughs> It seems to me that all the great men and women of God know this one place, and that's an intimate place of prayer with the Lord. And that's where things get done. I think it was Hudson Taylor that said this. He said, when we work, we work. But when we pray, God works. God works. Where are our prayers about? Well, I have my 20 minutes, you know, I, 10 minutes in the Bible and 10 minutes of prayer, and I did my, you know, my grocery list, you know, bless me, bless my dog, bless my M&Ms, <laughs> bless my day. Ha- hasn't he blessed us? When there's people like we have seen the last few months overseas that are going through what they're going through, and we're praying. Now, I'm not saying it's not, it's not right to pray for family and so forth, but sometimes we pray about the most trivial things. Selah. How about you? Is there something in your heart to which you know God has called you to and nothing has happened yet? I think about Christina last week when she came up and we sent her off and we prayed for her and Kurt said, you know, two years ago this would have been the last thing. And I wonder how many places of deep prayer she had and intimacy with God where the Lord spoke to her and she spoke to the Lord and now she's on the mission field in the Philippines. Wow. Wow. How long suffering without without fulfillment are we willing to be? Have you given up? Have you given up? 
Have you come to a place where you say, I give up, I'm not going to pray about this anymore? I have. And then I find out that God wants to do something more and something more and something more. And that drives me usually to my face or to my knees to say, you know, Lord, I have too small a picture of who you are. And yet Hannah doesn't have this small picture. She cries out to God. She pours everything to him in that prayer. I have a friend, his name is Baskader Dawson. He lives in India. He has founded uh, the Philadelphia churches there. He was a founding pastor in that. When he was first called to the ministry, the Lord called him to Madras, India, and for seven or eight years, he ministered there with the same 25 or 30 people every Sunday. And it was the same 25 or 30 people that would drag themselves in. And, you know, week after week, he saw hardly any new converts. He saw hardly any new people. And when he would go home at night, because at night the, the, the lights were off, the city street lights were off, he would take the subway home, and he would cry, and he would say, God, I thought you called me to this. When is, when is it that you're going to fulfill this? But you know, Lord, I guess I will take care of these 25 or 30, but I thought you called me to do something greater than this. And another year or two went by, and he was so discouraged, he decided he'd go to a pastor's conference. If he didn't hear from the Lord at this pastor's conference, then he thought maybe he'd hang it up. I don't know if you hang your Bible up, or you know, whether you hang your sandals up, or what they do in India, but... You know, he was ready to just hang it up. And he went to this conference and there was a prophetic word for him. And the prophetic word was this. I've seen you cry in the darkness as you have gone home. Wait for me. Wait for me to come to you. And I will bring the fulfillment that I promised you. And it wasn't five years later that he had about 800 people in his church. And now he's founded this Philadelphia church movement. You know, we live in such an instant society, don't we? Where we give up way, way too easy and way too fast. God is at work in us and he puts the idea first there and we're jazzed about it, but here's what has to happen sometimes. We get our fingerprints all over it, right? We get our fingerprints right over it and God says, okay, wait, I'm gonna wait on you, okay? I'm gonna wait for you. And we think it died. And it's like, okay, God, this is dead. I guess I'm not going anywhere with this and probably wasn't you, so it's dead. And the Lord comes back and he resurrects it because then we know that only he could do that. We get our, our, our fingers off of it for a while with our thinking and with what we do with that gift, that idea, or if you want to call it a dream, I don't like it, that idea, that burden, if you will. But then when he brings the fulfillment, it's like, wow, just like with Christina. Just like with Christina. Wow, God, look what you did. I think he loves surprising us like that, don't you? Ah, oh, man. Proverbs 13, verse 12 says this, the first part, hope deferred makes the heart sick. The Amplified Bible in 1 Samuel 1 says that Hannah was distressed in soul. There's a Chinese proverb that says, death of the heart is the saddest thing that can happen to you. Have you been there? Not even Elkanah's gift of a double portion could soothe Hannah. And then he says, aren't I better than 10 sons? <laughs> Guys don't get it, do they? <laughs> you know, I, I'm a giver of gifts, you know, and I, I, and I give morning flowers. And uh, when something's gone wrong, we, we never argue. But when something goes wrong, uh, 34 years, and we've never argued, which is a lie, so I better be careful. Uh, if something goes wrong, and I know for sure, you know, it's been my fault. And nine times out of ten, she lets me know that it is. Um, you know, I, I bring her flowers. Well, just think of this. What if I kept bringing her flowers and kept doing the same stupid vexing things to her? The flowers don't mean a lot, do they? And all the ladies said amen. It doesn't mean a lot. More stuff will not soothe the sick at heart. More stuff won't soothe the sick at heart. Hannah was at an accept no substitutes place. She cried out for a son, and she wants one so bad that she's willing to give him back to God. And then there's Eli. <laughs> Eli only went by what he saw. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. 
Put your wine away from you, woman. What are you doing drunk? Now, I wonder how many times she'd been at that place and moving her lips, but not praying out loud. And Eli's thinking, okay, this time I'm going to confront it. This time, I'm, and you know, if we're in leadership, don't we, uh, well, even if you're not in leadership, don't we jump to conclusions? I'm good at jumping to conclusions. Oh, this person must be like this. And Eli looked at her and said, put your wine away. How long are you going to be drunk? I remember that one day I was waiting for the bus downtown to take me home uh, to Renton. I had gotten off one bus from the University of Washington, had to catch a, a transfer bus to Renton. And I was waiting there for the bus. And I was waited for the bus. A Jehovah's Witness came up, and he started talking to the whole line of people that were waiting for the different buses there on 2nd Avenue. And I got in a conversation with him, and uh, he ended up walking away because, you know, I was so clever. Not really. Um, I was probably too loud and too boisterous. But anyway, there was a girl standing there, and she said, what, what was that all about? And I told her, I said, this guy's wrong. He's got a religious viewpoint that's, you know, whack. And, uh, you know, and I started to tell her about Jesus and what he had done in my life. And I, I kind of felt like that conversation was over until she got on the same bus with me. And as we got on the same bus and we began to talk together, I just kind of wanted to read my studies, right? I had, you know, I had a big test coming up or a big paper or something. I just wanted to get to my books, right? I, I'm on the bus. I got, you know, a half hour. And she said, you know, I think I know you. Were you in a band at one time? I said, yeah. And she said, well, I think I was in love with your organ player at one time. <laughs> I, think, I think I know your keyboard player. I think that we talked after one time, and she went on and on, and now get this. I would have missed this if I had not been in tune with the Holy Spirit. Because I, you know, I was wanting to get to my books, right? And it was like a channel came open to the Holy Spirit. Hey, guess who this is? This is so-and-so's cousin that you've been praying for for two weeks. This is the one who's dropped out of school and gone to three alternative schools. The Lord is speaking to me while she's telling me the story about how, how she was in love with a keyboard player at one time. I said, I know who you are. Your name's Donna. In fact, God's after you like the hound of heaven. And man, I'm telling you, she, you know, she, I mean, she just, she just broke down. Poor bus driver, you know, he's... <laughs> What's going on back there? You know, this girl, I mean, she is just, I, and I, I prayed with her. She didn't receive the Lord that night, but she came to the prayer meeting that my parents had uh, on Friday night. She came and she received the Lord, and then a few weeks later, she received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And last I heard, she was on the mission field. Okay, so if I would have taken this by the way it looked, okay, good. I was talking to Jehovah's Witness. I'm better than them, so let me get on the bus and go home. Please. Please. But instead, it was like when she started talking, I thought, oh, then, and I, I just kind of let the Lord speak to me. Now, that's a big jump, don't you think? I know who you are. There's a certain amount of faith involved, too, just like with Hannah. There's a certain amount of faith. But Eli took what, she, what he saw right at first. He thought she was drunk. And she said, oh, no, for out of my great complaint and bitter provocation, I have been speaking the fact that I feel bad enough about myself and I've been provoked so many times by Panina. This is, this is what I'm praying, Eli. She's laying it all on the line. Listen to what Eli does here. Here's some gifts from Eli. He listened to her with his heart. He believed and agreed with Hannah in prayer. He encouraged Hannah. Wow. And he said this, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant your request. Wow. You know, let's, let's deal from encouragement first. Why? Because encouragement is to the Christian what the message of salvation is to those receiving the Lord for the first time. Encouragement is to the Christian what the gospel message is to those that are just receiving him for the first time. Eli gives his amen. May that be so of us. May that be so of us. And with that word, with that amen, Hannah gets up to live her life, and she doesn't address the situation again that we know of. I'm impressed with Hannah's intimate faith, believing that God would answer her prayer. Her faithfulness is so impressive. Hannah emptied herself in prayer and was no longer in charge of what she was asking for. She knew it was all in God's hands. 
and she worshiped. Don't you love to get to a place where you can drop everything else, your worries, your cares, and just drop it, leave it at the cross, and worship? Isn't that a great place? I'm sorry, you can say amen. Isn't that a great place to get where you can just start, and you go, you know, Lord, you're in charge of my life, and you are the one that's going to take care of me, and I don't care about it. Now, okay, it might be just relief for a while, but it's, at least it's relief, isn't it? Yeah. And sometimes we just leave it. Isn't that great when we can just leave it? And then somebody comes up and bugs us about it again. Oh, yeah. The Lord will take care of her. It's all right. I left it with him. And this is the way, apparently, that Hannah was. But remember what she'd vowed, that she was going to give God's gift back to him. She promised to give back to God what he alone could give to her. Hannah knew that prayer was not a trading post, but a line of deep communication with God. It wasn't a trading post. I made a deal with God one time before I was a Christian. You ever try to do this? <laughs> like God makes deals. Somebody should have told me that he doesn't make deals. Okay, it's not let's make a deal. You know, deal or no deal. I was in this situation, my back against the wall. I mean, my life would have changed drastically, and I needed God's help. So I had been to enough church meetings to know that I could ask God for something. I said, God, if you do this, if you'll solve this for me, I'll read your word at least five minutes a night. Wow, how generous, Greg. <laughs> You're going to read the word five hours. And you know what? God miraculously solved it, and I began to read the word. Five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, half an hour sometimes. Sometimes a whole hour I would read the living Bible. And I just, you know, you know I, I misinterpreted it a few times after that. But I moved out with a bunch of guys, with a couple of guys, one who, in particular who had his new living, testament, living New Testament, and we would compare stories. This is before we were Christians. And the Lord began to birth something in me, like, you know, I'm real. And hear me, he didn't make a deal with me. All things work together for good, right? He was drawing me. He's drawing me. Hannah made that deal with God to let him know that she was serious about this. She was serious about this. She went away assured that God had heard her. Talk about intimacy in a relationship. If you give him to me, I'll give him back. Wow, what did that mean and what did it look like? And then it's, the Bible says in verse 19, in due time the Lord remembered her. God's timing is best. And when we depend on him for the timing and believe him for the answer, it's powerful. It's powerful. Hope deferred makes the heart, heart sick. You remember that? The second part of that verse says this in Proverbs 13, 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, the second part, but a longing fulfilled is the tree of life. This verse becomes reality to Hannah when Samuel is born. Samuel, the name Samuel literally means his name is God. His name from God. And it's translated here as heard of God, or I asked the Lord for him. Hannah names her son in memory of the event. You know the meaning of your name? Remember when Kurt talked about our name here and the new name that God's going to give us, but our name here has a lot to do with, I believe, the call of God upon our lives. My, my name, Gregory, means watchman. I didn't know this until I was about 17 years old. And the guy who let me know my name, and again, this was before I came to faith, he said, your name means watchman. I'm going to pray for you that God is going to put you over different groups of people. Wow. So our name has, has a, a great deal to do with, with our walk. Find out the meaning of your name. Maureen was, uh, one time she said, yeah, one, my name means bitter. Mara, bitter. And, you know, she, she really held that for a while, like, oh, man, my name really doesn't mean, you know, too, anything too good. Until we went to a conference where a guy who, a Jewish believer, said, you know, to have the incense made, you have to have this bitter element to release the good, that good smell, that good aroma in the temple. Wow. Woo! Man, your, ma your, name, your name really means something. That's Maureen, too, by the way. 
She carries out what she said she was going to do. It's better to not vow, Ecclesiastes said, than to make a vow and not keep it. Okay, how about this part? How many moms, dads, and grandparents would get to the point of having you know, a Sammy who is two, three, or four years old, and they get to this point where they have to give, give him up to Eli? I can just hear my dad. Now let's use some common sense. <laughs> God never leaves out the common sense. And let me add a little bit more to the story. Eli's sons were evil and perverting, perverted men. They were perverting the laws of the tabernacle and doing a lot of things that they shouldn't have been doing. Now how many of us would give up that little four or five-year-old to Eli? I think I'd have a little bit of trepidation. I'd be... I'd, Kind of maybe say this if I was Hannah. God, I know what I vowed, and you did give me a son, but you gave me a good brain too, didn't you? I don't think I'm going to give up Sammy right now, okay? I'm going to wait till a more opportune time. Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, it'd be like dropping your kid off when they were like, say, four or five at Penn State. And I'm not trying to do that to cause, a, you know, humor, but it'd be that kind of a tense situation. But Hannah had heard from the Lord enough in having a son and believing God that she could drop him off with Eli and God would take care of him because she'd heard from God and here was the evidence that she had heard from God so she was okay to leave Samuel with Eli and his two reprobate sons all three of them die in the same day you can read it further on in 1 Samuel I'm impressed with Hannah's completion of that intimate vow that she made to God. Of course, she kept him for a time, kept him at home. She nursed him. She loved on him. She prepped him as best she could. But from the time she became pregnant, she knew the clock was ticking, not her biological clock, but the time in which she would give up Samuel and leave him with Eli. Now, that's a gift. That's a really powerful gift. And the Bible says that she worshiped as she presented her first and only son so as to point to God's answer. Hard to imagine that Hannah, that Hannah didn't hesitate, but the Bible never records it. The days of intimacy and revelation with this miracle son, they were numbered, and now it was over. Just like Mary did with Jesus in giving up Jesus. The days you know, when Jesus got to be the, 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 the age for his ministry he was gone. Not gone forever, but he was gone. She gave him up. But how much more difficult would it be to give up a four or five-year-old? Think about it. To an old man and his two weird sons. All good and perfect gifts do come down from the Father of lights in whom there is no shifting shadow. But gifts in this life go back to God. You know, the tough part about an earthly gift is, unless it's Jesus, it's not forever. If it's not Jesus, it's not forever. That's why we should be thankful and living in thankful and gratefulness. Hannah received from the Lord and she gave back to the Lord. Because of that, God brought a judge to Israel. That's Samuel. A good judge, not Eli. A good judge to Israel. Vital to the nation's next step towards the Messiah. Samuel crowned Saul, the first king of Israel, and then he anointed David in that messianic line. It was so important that Samuel be raised up, given over to God, so he could fulfill what God had called him to do in Israel. The, the nation of Israel was one step closer because of Samuel's obedience, because of Hannah's obedience. That's intimacy. That's relationship. To trust so much in the God that you cried out to who answered you to go ahead and give up the gift. You know people that, that, that God has gifted and that maybe you know, it could be you, it could be a friend, it could be me. That when it's time to lay down a gift that God gave, oh no, uh-uh. You want me to do, no, no, no. God, you gifted me on the guitar. I'm not giving that up. I'm not giving that up. There's something wrong with that. Because it's, you have to give it up anyway at some time. Rapture, you know, you die, Jesus comes back, whatever. I mean, you're going to give it up. Somehow we think that these things last forever. They don't. They're terminal. Not trying to be morose, but I had a, an older friend who was 
uh, in a, um, a facility, an institution where they took care of my home facility because he had uh, Parkinson's. And I kept telling myself, you know, I'm going to go over there and see him. You know, it's probably time. You know, I know he's on the downhill, but, you know, he's got time. He's got time. He's got time. And two years later, he passed away, and I never got to say goodbye. Whether it's the gift of a person or whether it's just a temporal gift, things that we like to enjoy, those things go away. Hannah knew it better than most, and she was willing to just give him up. Okay. Here, Lord. At four or five, wow. Wow. Requesting, beseeching, pouring out our hearts, really getting into the yoke of prayer with God the Holy Spirit, doing that what we hear God wants and knowing that we heard him helps us to follow through in our obedience. Intimacy that we share with God should spill out to one another in the body of Christ and then even to our enemies. Remember me telling you about the neighbor from hell last January? <laughs> it should spill out to our... Can I say that in church? Okay. I mean... It should spill out to our enemies. Jesus told us to love our enemies. Let's tie this to the spirit of God at Christmas time. I want to go back to 1 Samuel 111. And she vowed a vow, that's Hannah, saying, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. I will give. The Lord himself will give you the sign. This is a well, uh, well-known scripture verse uh, from, <coughs> excuse me, from Isaiah 7, 14. The Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. God gives us his son. Another one from John 1.14, the word became a human being and lived here with us. We saw his true glory, the glory of the only son of the father. From him all the kindness and all the truth of God have come down to us. What makes it a real Christmas? One author said this, a real Christmas can be found at least in one place in the book of Matthew. The theology of Joseph made possible the first Christmas. If Joseph had not completely given himself to God's will in human history, the birth and the life of Jesus may have been quite different. The witness of Joseph calls us to cooperate with God's work in today's world. It calls us to respond to God's action with, with us as his children. Joseph, not having all the evidence and knowledge of the future, decided to do more than law and custom required. I love that. He elected to give more than was expected of him. He let justice and compassion guide his decision about his pregnant betrothed. He gave not by the strength of custom, but by the law of love. As we come to the first Sunday of this wonderful Christmas season, let's ask God for intimacy, a dearer nearness in our relationship to him that we've not known before. Let's ask him for the kind of Christmas that he will mark and we won't forget. The kind where we entirely give ourselves to him first and then invest in others. You know, Jimmy Carter forgot his wife's birthday one time. Oh my gosh, it's her birthday, and it's you know late in the morning. What am I gonna do? And his cousin's antique shop was apparently closed there in Plains, and he thought, what am I gonna do? And he thought about all the things he could give her. Give her. Now this is from his book uh, about faith, uh, and <laughs> he thought, you know, I, I'm really a rotten person when it comes to her being late. I'm always reminding her how late she is. You know, he thought it came from his dad and his naval training and so forth. So he took pen to paper and he wrote her a note. He said, Dear Rosalind, 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 from here on out, I will not ever again give you a bad time, kid you, or chide you about your tardiness. Love, Jimmy. By the way, Maureen, I have that same gift for you. (laughs) 
No comment, okay? That's something, although it's written down, the promise comes from here first. It's something we have to choose. There's lots of intangible gifts that we've talked about this morning. Intimacy, faithfulness. One thing that I, I don't hear a lot in church is about humility. Think of bo- about both Hannah and Eli in their humility. Jesus was clothed, clothed in humility. He died in humility. He's not coming back as a little lamb. He's coming back as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And by his blood and resurrection, we are saved. But he was clothed in humility. Dare his disciples be any different? What's the most precious precious gift you can give this Christmas? Like Hannah, we have a yearning for a son. But we have a yearning for the son, the son of God. And whether people are know it or not, they have a yearning for the son. That's why stuff doesn't do it for people. Think of all the things that go away, you know, after Christmas or that you take back. Are you good at taking things back? You know, my, my family is like, they just give me gift cards now. Yeah, he's, he takes it back anyway. Just give him a gift card. He doesn't know. He doesn't know what he wants. <laughs> just give him a gift card. What's the most precious gift you can give this Christmas? Like Hannah, we have a yearning. Hannah's deepest yearning was met when God answered her prayer. It brought courage to her to even give up Samuel. We don't lose when we give. Didn't, is it, doesn't it say in the book of Acts that Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive? Apparently Sally Brown didn't know that. We don't lose when we give, we grow. The deepest yearning, what is it? So that you can unwrap the gift of the Lord to you that will go to others. For Hannah, her gift was Samuel. But what is it for you? How can we better unwrap our gift from God and give more graciously this Christmas? What can we give to God? What can we give to others as a result? I think it it, it revolves around this verse, which is usually not used at Christmas time, but we know it really well. This is out of the Amplified. If you have problems hearing, this uh, comes right out of the Amplified. For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave up his only begotten and unique son. He gave him up to us. What? God, are you you crazy? Do you know me? Yes, he knows you. He knows the very hairs that are on our head and so forth and so on. Why do you still love me? Talk about second chances. How about second chances to a million and then put an exponent next to it? That he gave up his only begotten and unique son so that whoever believes in, that is, trusts in, clings to, relies upon him, shall not perish but come to, and, and not come to destruction and not be lost, but have eternal and everlasting life. I'm not a Christina, you might say. I'm not a Kurt Brunk. I'm not a Dave Brunk. You fill in the blank with people that you know. But you are one person, just like Hannah was one person, and Samuel was one person. And yes, with God, you can make a difference this Christmas. So let's put ourselves aside about what we want and what we think we need and what we have to get and what we have to spend, spending our money on things that, they, that people don't need on prices that we can't afford. Even a tank of gas, it seems like. But let's give. Let's ask God for the things that we need to give and then get up, believe him in faith, and move on and give it. And have Christmas be different. Have Christmas be different. He so loved and he gave up his unique son. Father, as we come to this place of communion this morning, we realize that you gave. You gave up your one and only unique and beloved son for us. And it doesn't stay with us. Lord, we come to the communion time this morning knowing that 
we've made a mess of things at different points. Lord, no matter whether we've set our face to obey the Ten Commandments as best we can or to live by the Sermon on the Mount or whatever it is, Lord, we fall short. We've messed things up. So, Lord, we take the cup this morning, and, God, we, we take that, the bread that's there in the cup, and, Lord, we break it, and we say, Lord, I want to be broken before you just like Hannah was. Maybe I'm not an emotional person, but Lord, I just, I want to give you my heart and I want you to break my heart with the things that break your heart. Whether it's family or friends or enemies or coworkers, Lord, I want, I want so to be different and like you. Father, we thank you for Jesus because of his body we can be made whole. So we take the bread in Jesus' name. Father, the same way we take the cup, and it's so great that you said, this is the new covenant in my blood. And Lord, we want a new covenant with you. We want the covenant that you would name. We want that relationship with you, Lord, like Hannah had, that's close, and we know that you're at hand, and we know that you've heard us. So, Lord, we take the cup, and, Lord, we seal, and we agree with you that the blood of Jesus was enough. Not Jesus and. Jesus is enough for us. Thank you for your blood. We take it in the name of Jesus.